going to walk you through um, I hope you'll take some notes during this. Uh, Cam is gonna be kind enough to share this PowerPoint with us. But, um, and if you want to roll down here and get closer, I welcome you to do that. It's very handy. Um, it's basically something that you can, um, it allows you some, it's another tool in your toolbox. It's another way of selling yourself to future employers. And if you go into, you can, um, if you want to kind of freelance or go into your, to, um, do, your, do your own thing, you can basically sell the fonts that you create. Um, so I guess the first question is how do I begin? Uh, there's kind of four areas that I'd like to, to demonstrate that you can, um, to get your inspiration from or ideas and how you create your font. So the first thing is you can fulfill a need. So that could be like the, the brush font that I created was I wanted a, a brush font, basically. Um, and I went looking and looking and every font that I found was not kind of what I wanted in terms of mood or character. So, so, I, wanted to, so I created a brush font that I could use. So fulfilling a need could be a, a serif font that you could use every day, just a regular body copy serif font or it could be a display font if you wanna do something special. If there's an idea that you have in mind, um, you really like brushes or you like crayons or you like whatever, that can be the genesis for your idea. Uh, second one, you can just describe a mood. So that's basically thinking, how would I describe whimsical in a font? How would I describe what is edgy and grungy in a font to me? What is whimsical and fun? What if, you know, so if you, if you use that as the basis for your thinking of describing a mood or trying to describe a character, you could be a character that you can think of, you know, whatever. Just that's another way to think about designing a font. Uh, third, you can look to other creatives for ideas. Um, I just listed three ideas that could be, you could go off of. Um, you can look at title cards for old movies. There's some great graphic design in uh, title cards for movies. Um, I love the design for North by Northwest by Alfred Hitchcock, it's, it's really great. Um, I watched Seven the other night, the, the graphic design for the title card there is phenomenal. Um, pointillism of Syrah, so you could do a pointillist font, you could maybe do a color font, you could do something that if you go and look at his paintings, it could be the genesis for an idea. And lastly, you can look at other foundries or type designers, go in creative market and just see what maybe what's most popular, what other people are doing, and just just know that it's inspiration and not theft. Um, they could, uh, you don't wanna steal someone else's idea, you just wanna be inspired by their idea. And then lastly, if you're kind of a freewheeler, a rebel, you can just be spontaneous. You can just grab something and grab a piece of paper and go at it. Uh, you can draw shapes, lines, types of lines, squiggles, wiggles, whatever. Um, you can use a, a medium that you're not used to, crayon, uh, whatever, um, thinned oil paint, gouache, watercolor, pen, pencil, uh, light pencil, a heavy pencil, um, stick. a stick, <laughs> you can draw on the mud, you know, whatever kind of you want to do to get your mind going. And lastly, just experiment. Just sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen or whatever, a sharpie, and just bash out something. All right. Any fonts to stay away from? Well, yes, there are several fonts you do not want to deal with. Uh, script and calligraphy fonts are not your friend in this, because you have, <laughs> you have such a short amount of time. The, the problem with these is that you are, you're not designing words, you're designing glyphs. So when you design a script, you have to deal with the, the hooks, the hanger honors like this. And basically every time you design something, these have to match up. So if you're if you're doing these each individually by hand, even if you're if you end up here and this one starts down here, you have to either find an, find the middle ground or redesign one of the two glyphs. And that is labor intensive and not for this kind of the amount of time you have for this. Um, 
So it's best saved for if you're like, if it's a pet project that you, you absolutely want to, by all means, save that for later, um, unless you're a masochist. <laughs> <laughs> and you like that. Um, the other one, modular or geometric fonts, it is much more, um, these are bland, these are boring, anyone can do it. It's not really what this class is about. It's not really what the project is about. Um, if you want, I saved a modular font for after this class or for the next one. Um, kind of use this one to kind of explore the, the type design, to explore what your creative side, because modular and geometric fonts are just assemblages of shapes in the sense that that's all they are. So you can't experiment any, any way beyond that. They are uncreative and unoriginal. Not to say that they're bad because then they all have their uses just for this project. They are not what you're after. So there are several tips to keep in mind as you're designing. Um, what kind of font, what type of font do you want to design? Do you want a sans serif? Do you love serifs? Do you want to display? Do you want something totally crazy and out there? Do you want simply dingbats? You know, do you want just a, a font of symbols? Just keep that in mind and as you go forward. Uh, think about your case type. Do you want an uppercase and a lowercase? Do you want only an uppercase? If you only want an uppercase, um, make sure, and I'll show you later, to have your uppercase in both the uppercase and the lowercase settings in font self. Um, do you want small caps? So just think about that as you're designing. Kerning and letting. Um, Font self, and I guess anything kind of beyond that imagines a, when I say imagine a rectangle around each glyph, think of this as kind of the border. I think, think of the, the old typesetting as each letter was on a, you know, lead grid and it was stamped into something. So if you imagine a box around each letter, it's like a Y. So keep that in mind as you're designing, kind of design for the space. Um, because if you do something kind of way out there, you can erase all that if you need the room. Oh, no problem. Right. So if you do like an X like this, you have all this empty space right here. So that's going to be a pain going forward because everything, everything you do after that is going to have to be kerned to this X. If you have, and if that probably, if you design it this way, that's not going to be the only setting you have too. You might have an A that looks like this, and then you have, you have a lot of negative space that you have to keep in mind. So. Do something with, think of a, a rectangle around what you're designing and that will help you design better. Cam, can I interject? Everyone is familiar with the typeface called papyrus, right? Yes. Every time you use a capital P, anything that follows it looks like it's two steps away. Yes. Because the rectangle imaginary box around the P, because the P is very wide, it leaves this big hole. And every time you see it on a logo or something, nine times out of 10, they didn't take that into consideration and did not kern that. But that is an example that anytime you use papyrus, if you ever use a P and some of the other letters as well, a T, anything with that, that wide um, span, you've got to kern it or it's going to look bad. But that's in the design of the, the glyph or the character, and you can adjust and kern in font self as well. All right, next would be uh, keep in mind your numerals and symbols. So you need numbers and you need symbols like the hashtag, like the ampersand, like the dollar sign, the asterisk. Um, kind of, it doesn't, you don't have to go crazy. The at sign, um, just what, do, you want it to be useful to yourself or someone else in the future. So think about what keys, what glyphs that you use throughout and just keep that in mind. And I, the second one I, I put there is the zero, keep in mind the zero and the O. So when you're designing a zero and an O, how will you distinguish the two? So it's just something to keep in mind. And finally, ligatures and diacritics. So the diacritics, if you don't know, is like the tilde sign. Uh, or the, ac the um, acute and the yeah. grave, those kind of things. So go later on, if you plan to sell your font, you're gonna have to make this as accessible to as many non-English speakers as you can. 
So a lot of, um, I will show you a, a recommended character set for a fully fleshed out font. And most of them require tildes and uh, diacritics and things like that. Uh, and finally, ligatures. So ligatures are, are kind of like diphthongs for words. So a good one is the AE sign. So whenever you see that showing up in a, um, in a font or, or wherever, that's a, that's a ligature. Another one is the FI. So it's basically, you have to think about when these were handwritten, however many years ago, it's just ways of um, both of saving the, per the copyist time of writing, but it also um, makes it the, the kerning and the things flow a lot better because if you have an F and an I, it kind of gets muddled depending on how it's written or if you're dealing with ink, the colors might, the inks might run together. So this was a way of working around that. So keep that in mind. It's not necessary, but it's, I, I think it's kind of a nice touch, especially on a handwritten font. It just shows that you care a little bit more, I think. So the font itself can make this, can make these ligatures automatic or discretionary, and that's up to your choice. Do you want, every time there's an A followed by an E, do you want it to be automatic or do you want it to be up to the person using your font to, to include that? So font self, it is an extension uh, you can use for Photoshop or Illustrator. I, I usually, I just stick to Illustrator because you're dealing with vector images and Photoshop deals with pixels mainly. So it makes more sense in Illustrator for me. Uh, and basically the, what it does is it converts vector uh, images or vector shapes that you create and wherever, um, it converts it to an open type or an OTF font. So this gets to my creation, Banzai, also known as Boku. Um, so mine was kind of, like I said before, it was inspired by I needed a brush font, and the brush fonts that I found were not what I wanted to use, so I created, so that was the genesis of the idea. Um, and from that, I was really interested in bonsai trees at the time, and Sumia paintings, um, so, and calligraphy, so that is basically uh, where I went with my design idea. Um, and so because of that, I basically created these on so these are the original things I used to create. They're 18 by 24. I'm in white. Uh, they're 18 by 24. I just used acrylic, watercolor, acrylic, whatever. Um, and I held it. There's a, a way to do the sumie in that you 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 can go the the route of grinding the ink. Um, there's a dish, and you hold the brush in a certain way, like this, um, parallel to the or perpendicular to the paper. Um, so that was my idea and that was how I created these. Um, the way that I set myself apart was that I created some illustrations, kind of Sumie inspired illustrations. So these would, so um, you'll see them a little later, but just things that kind of evoke the mood and the piece that I'm working on. So a bunny, a flower, or a, a birds, some flowers, uh, I have an orchid somewhere, not on this one. So yeah, so it's just ideas and just a way to, oh, there's the orchid, just a way to set my font apart from everyone else. It gives them a reason to, to buy my font. Why would they want it? Because there's, not only is it a brush font, but it has all these kind of cool illustrations for it. Okay, um, I will demonstrate a little later on my, I'll show you an example of all this because I know it's kind of hard to visualize this. So these are some tips and ideas when you're setting up your artboard for, to, to use Illustrator, or sorry, to use Font Self in Illustrator. You would want to use guidelines and you're gonna set these guidelines as your baseline, X height, and ascender, and descender. So you just take your guidelines and you'll set them. Decide what's your, um, where your X height is, where your baseline is, your sender, and your descender and set everything up on the um, set everything up on your art artboard to that so um, because going forward when you import something it's good to bring the baseline in as you import it just to keep everything consistent um, keep each case on its own baseline 
that just facilitates importing and it helps make sure that everything is proportional and the same. Um, alphabetical order, if you're not a heathen. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know why you would not want to put it in alphabetical order, but that's you. You can do that if you want. Um, Concept might get confused if you don't. Yes. <laughs> Um, I use the pencil or the pen tool. You can use the um, pencil or pen tool to clean up your or redraw your fonts. So to import this, to import this, I basically I take this to a wall, I photographed it, I imported it into Photoshop, and then I jacked up the contrast between the paper and the ink. I used black ink initially just to better um, to, be to better help with the contrast. So I. Once you set up the contrast, you import it into Illustrator, image trace it, and delete all the white around it, and you have all the symbols. Um, I, I know you use the capture, but I use the, I, 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 have, a, I have a DSLR camera. It, because I wanted the brush strokes at the ends of each glyph, I wanted the, the camera was better at capturing that than the Adobe Capture is able to. So that was just a personal thing for me. The font that you design might be perfectly acceptable using Capture but there are more than one ways to import your font into Illustrator. And lastly, just be sure all your glyphs are the same size and are proportional. Um, you don't wanna, if you're doing a thick font, you don't want an X, it's like this. You know, that that's that is he as heavy as that and an A that's like that. You know, so keep all your weights and everything consistent and just be mindful of that. And that's where the pencil and the pen tool come in handy as you're kind of cleans things up as you go into, um, as you um, put it into font self. Okay, um, when you're importing your font, you can either import each glyph individually. So that's good if you have to redesign something, you can drag it back in. Um, but to start out with, it's probably best that you just import the entire case. So if you're just doing uppercase, just drag the whole uppercase. Font Self is pretty good at recognizing that stuff and they, they make that the importing process as easy as can be. Um, as you're importing it, always make sure you grab the, the baseline as you're importing it. So that just, because um, some of my fonts, the way that it's brushed, parts of it sit below the baseline. Um, so I wanted to keep that as I imported it. So always include the baseline as you drag it into Font Self. Um, double check that the glyph you draw, it matches the glyph that Font Self recognizes. Um, some of the illustrations, Font Self was thinking it was something else. It was like the and sign, or the at sign, or the ampersand, or whatever. So just double check and make sure that if you're importing an ampersand, Font Self knows that it's an ampersand, it's not something else. Uh, and again, about ligatures, um, standard or discretionary. Standard is it's automatic. Discretionary is up to the person who's using the font to decide. So, um, and uh, if you do ligatures and you do import them, uh, Font Self will ask you this question. So don't worry. Um, so after you've imported it, the next probably the most tedious and the technical part of this is spacing and kerning. So um, I'll show you the tabs in Font Self, but you can adjust the spacing and the kerning. So spacing adjusts the edges of your type. So if you, again, imagine that square or that rectangle, um, say your X, but you have like a little squiggly thing go up to the side there, it's gonna set, the font self will think that this is the outermost border. So font self will recognize as that that is the outermost border of your font and that's, um, that's going to create a lot of mistakes going down the road. You're going to have to kern a lot. So basically spacing says to font self, no, 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 don't, don't put it right here. The edge of my font is actually right there or, you know, wherever. So it's good to start with that first because it, it helps alleviate the kerning process, the next stage of the kerning process. So the spacing adjusts the edges of your types. Kerning adjusts the space between the two individual glyphs. So there's a difference if you're, if you did, if you design this X like this and you find that you're having to kern a lot, then it might not be, it might not be the spacing between the character, the, like the, the how do I say this? 
it's not necessarily the kerning's fault, it's the spacing. So it's, it saves you more time and trouble to just adjust the spacing than to go through and kern it to every letter in the alphabet. Um, it's, a it's, it's a tedious process, it's a long process, um, but it's, it saves, you know, it's professional and it looks good in the long run. Um, so adjust spacing before kerning to save yourself time. Um, use the kerning and spacing pad. Font Self has, provides a lot of like example words that you can use to see your, your font that you designed in action. So make use of it. I, I've scrolled through it, look at it at different sizes, give it a um, kern some, walk away for a day, come back. Uh, just give yourself some time. Give yourself a lot of time for this because it is so tedious. Um, there's kerning pairs versus kerning groups. So when you get to this stage, you can either kern individual letters or you can do something which I learned a little too late, which is you can kern groups. So it's very help, kerning groups is very helpful and it will save you a plethora of time with diacritics because um, say like this. So if you go through and you space and you kern everything for the A, basically if you kern pairs for this letter, you're gonna have to basically go back and recreate this individually by hand. It took me like a day one time. <laughs> it's not fun. Um, well, so that's by kerning pairs, but font self has a, uh, a way of kerning groups. So you can set it up in font self to have all the kerning of the A automatically be transferred to the kerning of this, which saves, like I did it in like five minutes. So a day, five minutes, I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, so just keep that in mind and I will show it to you. Cam, I don't know if it's in your presentation, but I think you told me when we first did this, um, it took you about six hours or nine hours to create the font. Mm -hmm. So that's not long. You could do it in a day, but this part was what? Long, long time. 80% of it? Yes. Yeah. The, the designing the design is the fun part. Uh, yeah, the designing and the creating it is the fun part. This is the part that kind of makes you a professional, makes you a graphic yes. designer. This is why default fonts are bad, usually. <laughs> I mean, they don't have correct spacing because it's hard mm -hmm. and it takes a level of patience and attention to detail and time. So, yeah, yeah. this is definitely something you cannot procrastinate on. Um, give yourself more time than you think you'll need because you will need it. Um, and it is pretty, it's really something you can't kind of cut a corner on because it, it shows up pretty easily. Okay, so I think the last thing you'll be doing with this is creating a spec sheet, kind of like the one that I created. So you're kind of preparing this to sell as if you're going to sell it. Um, there's a lot of foundries you can research to kind of get ideas. I'm sure you'll have one for this project in terms of dimensions, like the dimensions of the tiles, the number of the tiles that you'll, you'll be using, how many tiles, you'll have a title card, you'll show the glyphs, um, mock-ups, things like that. <clears throat> so in the future, if you wanna do it yourself, just look to whoever you're trying to sell it to for, for um, their specifics, because they're all different. Um, your design, the design of the spec sheet should complement the design of the font. Um, you don't want kind of soft pastel colors on this like bold, aggressive, I don't know, brush font. So make sure the design of the spec sheet highlights and complements the design of the font. Um, because they see it, because someone scrolling through Creative Market will see that first. They might not see the font itself, but they'll see the design of the font. And so you want it, to, you, don't want, you don't want false advertising. You, know, you, want, you want the design to match the font. Um, so as you're designing the spec sheet, present it, um, present all your glyphs on a separate card, just A, B, C, D, F, G, you know, just lay out the entire alphabet and numerals and ligatures and things like that, just so someone can have it as a reference point or they can see it kind of um, on its own that they can then apply later on. And then lastly, give a lot of options. Um, just think of how your font can and will be used. You can make up some logos, you can create a bunch of mock-ups. So is it something that looks good on the t-shirt? Make it look good on a t-shirt. It could be on bags, stationery, business cards, and if it's a professionalicious uh, font, 
business cards, logo, um, um, letterhead, things like that. Um, and finally, typography quotes. Um, if it's a font you've created that's inspired by somebody, use one of their quotes. Just find ways of um, showing your font both in a kind of visual setting and a um, typography setting. And that's it for that. So, while Cam's getting this together, if you need to take a little quick break, let's um, do that now. Cameron, take it away. <laughs> All right. So, this is kind of. Um, so, I'm trying to get out here. I just want to show you everything, like the whole artboard. So everything basically is put on one line, you can see. So all my uppercase are on one line. Um, I originally started with just the kind of the basic Latin alphabet, 26 characters, but um, I'm now able to sell this font. And to do so, I had to basically expand upon the idea and include all these diacritics over here um, and a lot of additional symbols, which I will show you later on. Um, so if you can see on my board, So you can see I have guides over here. I have that on a separate board or a separate layer. Um, so then I have each one labeled. It's good to do that because it helps font self as you're importing the file. As you're importing each letter into the file, it helps um, font self know why you're dragging this line in. Otherwise, <clears throat> excuse me, it will just think it's another character or a glyph. So I have these labeled. Um, there's my X highs. See, it's fairly consistent, but you see sometimes things kind of dip below mm. or above. So I had to adjust the size of these. There's my descender. So the descender I'm a little more um, judicious with, or I'm more strict with, I guess, the descender because it affects the next line as you're you know, dealing with lighting and stuff. So that one's more or less same. Just a note, when you're working with curved letter forms, let's say a capital G, and you've got it next to any other capitals that are not curved, if you don't design it where the curve goes above that ascender just a little bit, it's going to always appear short. It's going to look wrong. So always, just like his O's and N's down here, you want to go over the X height a little bit for anything that's curved or over the ascender line, just a little bit. Visually, it's gonna make it look the same size. And so here's some, like, uh, uh, some symbols. Again, I've expanded upon this just due to the requirements to sell it, but you can see I have pretty much everything you know, numbers, they're my numerals. Mm -hmm. kind of Those guidelines also help font self know the quote is not sitting on the baseline. Yeah. It's up a certain space. So yeah, especially when you're importing, you'll want to, especially with things like this, you'll want to import it with the baseline. Because like she says, um, if you don't, font self just thinks it's going to sit on the baseline. So if you import it with the baseline, it's going to add prompt you. Are you sure you want to do this? And you're like, yeah. Um, so it's just, it's kind of like, yeah, font self, I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'm going to see if this works. Oh, and lastly, I just want to say with your, if you do illustrations, ding bats, you can basically make them whatever, you know, it can be like, Mr. Doug here can be the capital A if you're just doing dingbats. So that's up to you to decide what is what character if you're doing strictly dingbats. Um, this is still, um, Inner Diacritics, this uh, font self does recognize these. Um, you just have to, when you're typing in the character up here to import it, just, I usually, um, I just found a Unicode. I, or you can use the Unicode on your keyboard here. Um, I have a small Mac, so I can't do that. 
So you can just go find the Unicode or copy and paste it in there. Uh, font itself will recognize it. Ascender and the baseline grouped. Um, so let's see if this works. Okay. So for whatever reason, it doesn't know what it is. So I'm just going to type it in. Do all these, but so, like I said, sometimes it won't recognize it. Here it goes. I also forgot to mention one thing that's kind of helpful. Um, when you're doing your spacing and your kerning, um, font self will use your capital H and your capital O, and your there we go, uh, <laughs> your lowercase n and your lowercase o um, as your kind of what you base everything else off of. So keep that in mind as you're designing, because um, it will use your H and your O to set up the spacing and the kerning for every other letter. So it's not. In, I mean, it is kind of important, but. It, don't let that be the deciding factor, just something to think about. Okay, that's enough, I guess. So, here's the kind of the, here's the panel for the font cell. Um, so you can adjust the spacing of the letter here. I don't really do that because I like to see it in context. You can adjust the line spacing. So the distance, you can kind of use this pad right here to do that. Again, I don't really like to do that. Um, and here, this adjusts the scale of your of what you're designing. So the letter scale, basically, compared to other fonts out there, this you can make it larger or smaller. And I'll see. If, at least on, on my preview, it shows like an A, or like in this case, it would show like a generic E. And you can visualize how much larger or smaller your E is com compared to that. Um, you can go in and adjust things. If you click on this thing right here, it shows you each character individually. So this is your descender. This is your ascender, baseline. So you can adjust things manually, individually like this. You can just drag it down. Um, or you can type in stuff up here. So, you, so this is your left spacing, your right spacing. So you can adjust that numerically up here. Um, and when you adjust the ascender and the descender for one character, it does it for every other character. So if you do include diacritics, you can adjust the ascender for your, um, whatever is the tallest character that you have, and, every, and it will be the same for everything to follow up. Okay. So if you want to import a ligature, So I'm going to try and import this AE right here. So to do that, you just type AE up here. And it's going to say create ligature. You say, sure. No.
Lord this day. Lotus E. That was wrong. So like I said, standard, it's default. It will do it automatically or discretionary. The user can do it. I'm just gonna say standard because I like I like the way the show up. Okay, so remember to um, always save often. It's not on here, but you there is a, a tab to save. Um, you can export it. And export it, which I guess turns it into the OTF font. So this will say create, um, pick a name. Later on, you can decide, you can have a link to your your design portfolio. You can say who designed it. You can put a copyright notice on it. Just information to, to set your, your font apart. So now the most, all your work will be done in the advanced tab. So you can see this is the spacing tab. So now because he didn't type in all the letters to identify him, that that's why you're getting the kind of courier yeah, look. Um, so if you had to put it in everything, bring Here you can click on individual uh, letters, and these bars right here represent the spacing. So you can also type in here. Too. So most of these, like I said, um, they will use the H and the O and the lowercase n and O to, to denote spacing, or it uses a guide for spacing. So like for the C and the H, I kind of want it maybe, let's say a, a little tighter. So do not click on the H, click on the C. And then you can just visually, you can just manually adjust spacing. Like so. And it records it down here. Make that a little tighter too if you want. So you can adjust it this way. Um, if everything were filled in down here, it would give you different examples. So as you're reading, so you maybe make a couple adjustments, scroll down here, see the your font in action. And so you can copy and paste those words up into here and then adjust spacing as you need to. So once, you, once you've done that, you go over to the kerning tab. And again, well, I don't see the groups on here, but so the D and the E, there's a little bit extra space in there for what I like. So you, you always click on the thing you want to adjust, not what you're adjusting to. And you adjust the kerning towards to close that group. And again, it records it down here. You can delete it later on if you want to. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty rough overview. Um, let me import one of my caricatures out of here. I want to make that cat R. <laughs> Every time you type an R when you export it, it's going to make a little cat face. So always, always, always save, 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 save. So, and it will, it usually creates a little asterisk, you see, right there, kind of like any other the Adobe things. If you haven't saved in a while, it'll be like, hey, you might want to save that. So you can also move in batches. Usually, like I said, when you drag in a whole, let's see if I can do your numbers, maybe. Okay. 
So see, it will kind of recognize. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. Nice. Now, one thing I think I was noticing here, your glyphs and your little images, are all of those compound shapes? Mm -hmm. Um, are your diacritic marks separate or are they also compound? These are grouped. That's a good question. Okay. Um, so if you, if they aren't grouped and you highlight everything, so if, if this view with the, the circumflex was not grouped, it would treat it as two separate um, glyphs. Two separate glyphs. So keep that in mind. Group things that are meant to be grouped, like the quotation marks. Group those. And I'll just show you. Last thing I'll show you is that. So, like I said, I kept the baseline with the quotation mark. See, it imports it. Here's the baseline right here. So, including the baseline just tells font self, yes, I need to do this. Okay, um, I think that's a good overview um, for the application itself. So, you see all the things I did. So, all that has to be current and leaded and uh, spaced. So, again, just keep in mind that that's going to be the bulk of your work is turning and spacing and all that stuff. Yeah. Any questions about this? It'll change your life. Yes. <laughs> it's really fun. I, I I don't mean to harp so much on the work that is involved in the kerning and spacing, but it is really fun. You get you get you get really into it. Um, it kind of becomes a little hypnotic, uh, um, but by the end of it, you have a greater appreciation for spacing, kerning, other people's hard work in type designing. You appreciate like kind of the the gods of type, so to speak, the the, the types that have lasted as long as they do, the Baskervilles, the so and sos, the Helmeticos. It um, you really appreciate why they are the way they are, why people kind of enjoy them so much. You, you get a better understanding. Um, and I guess lastly, I'll just close on my own font. So the font that I created started out as Bonsai and to sell it, so I went to sell it, I sold, sold it on my fonts. Um, and to sell it, uh, I went to, I had to upload it. I had to, you have to include so many tiles, I think at least five. They have to be to a specific dimension. They have a recommended character set. So if you have anything less than this, your font will be rejected. And the whole point is that you're doing a lot of work and you want it to be as accessible to as many people as possible. So um, that is a very helpful guide. And if you want to take whatever font you create and expand upon it, it's a very helpful guide to make sure that you have everything that you need to have that a standard font would have. So this is the font I created. These are the um, cards that I created for it. So you kind of see that it basically mimics the character of the font. So um, it started out as bonsai. Bonsai was copyrighted, copyrighted written by two other <laughs> by two other um, uh, font designers, foundries. So I had to come up with a new one. So I just changed it to Boku, which is short for Sweet Boku, which is another name for Sumi paintings. So that's the name of it. But you see, I have a title card. It's what they see when they first scroll past it. All my uh, the alphabet, numbers, ligatures, all the punctuations, dichrical marks. These are my illustrations. I thought that was a big selling point for this font. So that's why I kind of made them stand out and as big as they are. So to demonstrate it, I've seen before, I included some ideas for logos. Again, I think with, um, especially with um, dingbats and illustrations like this, I, at least for me, I tend to find that it's hard to imagine how that can be used in addition to the font. So I just made sure to include a couple of those to show how the illustrations can kind of interact with the, 
the font itself. Um, here's a, a quote. You know, is there some pure typography? And then lastly, a couple of mock-ups just showing you, can be on shirts, bags, pillowcase. Um, if you had a business, it uh, can be like a painted sign on the glass out front of a business. So it's just thinking about who would, who would want to use this, why would they want to use this, and how can I, um, how can I sell that to that person. So yeah, so I've priced this um, $12, which I felt was kind of for my first font um, being sold and it's just one. I felt it was a good, a nice round number to, to aim for. Um, anything more I, I would think have to be, um, I mean, this did take a lot of work, but I feel like it would have to take even more work and maybe with a little bit more experience it come, the price would go up. But I think like 10 to 15, if you do end up selling it, is a good ballpark in my opinion. Um, so yeah, that is that's basically it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs>